Luke 22, starting in verse 31. Today, we're going to piggyback off of what we kind of studied last week, where we, we got a really big encouragement from Jesus and from the example of the disciples that we don't have to be perfect, right? And I think, you know, our goal is to be holy as he is holy, right? But we understand that on this side of eternity that we are not going to be perfect. And I think Jesus knows that. And Jesus allows grace in our life for that. We don't walk in this life knowing that we can just go about it, not striving for perfection, right? And just doing wrong, but understanding that I strive for perfection, I'm going to fall and he's going to pick me back up, right? He's going to be, he's going to be long-suffering with me. He's going to be patient with me. He's going to be kind. He's going to be gentle. And he's going to correct me when needed. And ultimately, he's going to pick me back up. And so last week, what we saw was the disciples arguing about who's the greatest. Remember that? So right after Jesus institutes this new covenant, you know, he's like, man, I'm about, I'm about to die for your sins. This is a serious thing. And I want you to always remember this. And I want you to establish this tradition within, within the church to constantly remember as, as my disciples that I shed my blood for you and that you have now been saved and redeemed from the slavery of sin and the consequences of it. And right after that, they start arguing, well, who's the best? Who's the greatest of them all? Who, do you, who has the most followers? Right? And Jesus, he corrects them. He loves them. And he says this in verse 25. He says, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Those who exercise authority over them are, are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. He says, for who is greater, who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? And then he flips the script of what everyone thinks. And he says, no, who's the greatest? He says this. He says, yet I am among you as the one who serves. So if Jesus, who is the greatest, is the one who serves, well, then it's the one who serves is the greatest, not the one who is being, uh, who is, um, being served. He says, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials. And that's the verse I wanted to get at. So he's like, look, you know, you're arguing about this. Let me, let me correct you. Let me show you the right path. Let me give you the truth. But he's like, you know what? Instead of getting upset that you guys are just not getting it right now, he's like, I know you're going to mature over time and you're going to get it and some things you don't fully understand until later, until I send the helper. But he says, look, you are those who have continued with me in my trials. You're here. You're present. And that was the encouragement for us last week, right? That we're not perfect people, but... The fact that we're here, it, it says something. The fact that we're constantly trying says something. The fact that we, we want to grow in the Lord says something. And so he encourages them with that. And then we get into this section here in verse 31. I'm going to go ahead and read 31 through 38. And we'll see another encouragement for us. That faith, it may falter, but it doesn't fail. Because I know, and this is a great message for those of us who are young, because sometimes we question our faith. We question, you know, is it something I, I can lose? Is it something, you know, where I can, you know, it, when I fall, have I lost my salvation? Am I, am I, am I, am I right with God? Like, it, it, did I just lose my ticket into heaven? But we're going to see here that even Peter, who is a great apostle and disciple of Jesus Christ, he falters in his faith. You know, he, he wavers, he doubts, he denies. You know, we'll get into that actually in that section in a couple of weeks, but here Jesus is going to warn him that he's going to deny, that his faith is going to falter, but it will not fail. And we'll see one key reason why your faith will not fail. So verse 31, it says, The Lord said, Simon, Simon, this is Peter's old name, his original name, his birth name. He says, Indeed, Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And Jesus said to them, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said nothing. And he said to them, But now, he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise the knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. 
For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he who is numbered with the transge- he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. And so here he starts off with calling him Simon. Again, this is Peter's name that his parents gave him when he was born. But when, when Peter first met Jesus, Jesus says to him in John chapter 1, verse 42, he says, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. And Cephas, this is an Aramaic word for stone, but the word John used for stone in the Greek is Petros, which is the name of Peter. Hence why we get his name Peter. So we call him Peter, but his given birth was Simon. So Jesus is going back to that, that name that he has given him, Cephas, which means stone or a rock, right? That, that we see this after his faith falters, then his name is actually who he is. He becomes a stone. He becomes unwavering, right? But we do see in a moment that his faith is going to falter, that it's going to waver, but there's one thing that's going to cause it never to fail. And it's what Jesus says here in verse 32, but we'll get to that in a second. He says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you. (laughs) Could you imagine that? Can you imagine like Satan calling up Jesus and be like, hey, you know, what about that Jeffrey guy? You mind if I like sift him? You mind if I like, you know, just beat him up a little bit? I'd be like, Jesus, when you see the caller ID, hang up. Don't even answer it, right? When Satan calls, don't answer it. But one thing we see here is there is this spiritual battle that's going on, right? The, the, the life that we live is not just physical, it's spiritual. Satan's real, and Satan is losing a battle. He's already lost, and he's, he's continuing to lose this lost battle, and he wants to come after us. Because what we're going to see here in this verse, in verse 31, where he says, that Satan has asked for you, it is plural. So really what Satan has done is he's asked for the disciples, but he's speaking individually to Peter in this very moment. Because Satan will, as we're going to see, come after him. He's going to try to sift him as wheat. And what this does, this, this picture of Jesus saying sifting as wheat, it's this picture of shaking someone up to separate them from what's important. And I think there, there's two things, and they may... I think, kind of overlap and be one and the same. There's two things that Satan's going to try to separate Peter from. And I think that's his faith and or Jesus. Okay, those, those two things. If, if Satan can do that, then man, he's, he's done a good job. If he can separate us from Jesus, ultimately meaning our faith, then he's done a good job. But one thing we see here is that Satan doesn't have the ability outside of asking for Jesus' permission to come to, for us, right? That every time that we see that Satan wants to attack an individual person, what does he have to do first? He has to get permission, right? He's like, you know, a kid who has to go to his parents and ask them for permission to do such and such. Why? Well, because the parent has the authority. Well, in this situation, when it comes to Satan and God, they're not, you know, these co-equal you know, beings that are fighting against each other and one's good and one's bad. No, one is a, one's God and one is another created being, right? And Satan, who was Lucifer. And he doesn't have any authority outside of God's authority. We understand this, right? Matthew 28, that God has given Jesus all authority. So even that, Satan has to come to Jesus and ask permission. We see that with Joe, we see it with Peter here. He has to ask if he can do something. And what does Jesus do? I don't know what his answer was per se to Satan at this moment, but I'm, sh- I'm sure it was like, yeah, okay. But why does, why does Jesus allow that? Why does he allow that? I think there's two things. Is he knows what's going to produce in us. It's going to produce something good. And two, that Jesus will be with us the entirety of the time that it can never truly break us. That your faith can never truly fail but that it will only falter. Because this is what he does in verse 32. He says, I have prayed for you. Man, if anyone's going to pray for you, sure, by all means, you know, you want your parents praying for you, you want your friends praying for you, but Jesus is constantly advocating for you. He's praying for you. He's on your side. 
And it, that is the very key of why your faith will never fail if you have truly put your faith in Jesus Christ. Your faith is solid. There's no one that can take it. There's nothing that can happen in your life where it, it would fail. It can falter. You know, it can become uneasy and you can stagger, but it will never truly fail. So Satan's coming after Peter and he says, I want to sift him as we, again, we talked about how this is the separating from what's important. Peter's like a kernel of wheat, and his faith is like a husk. We see this, you know, with, with, with the winnowing fan, you know, how, how there's some who are chaff and, and some who are, are the wheat, right? That ultimately what is not good will be blown away, right? Speaking of the chaff. And so Satan's desire is to shake Peter so hard in a trial that he separates Peter from his faith, from Jesus, but it's not going to happen. Why? Again, Jesus says, I have prayed for you. He's praying specifically for Peter, but he's also praying for us. Hebrews 7.25 says this, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That word intercession is, is prayer. That's what we're doing as we pray. We're, we're interceding. But Jesus does it on the behalf of, of us to the Father. He sits at the right hand interceding for us. So that why? He says, I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Does Peter's faith fail? As we're going to see later on. Right? He, he's going to come before a, a young lady, a, really a teenage girl. And he's going to curse her out and deny that he ever knew Jesus, right? Could you imagine, like, you know, here's, guys, out in the commentary. Could you imagine if Patrick, like, if you came up to him and, and you were like, hey, you know, like, do you love Jesus? And Patrick all of a sudden loses his boldness and starts cursing you out and be like, no, I don't go to church. I've never been to Calvary Chapel. I don't know anything about Jesus, right? And then, you know, starts adding some colorful words in there. You'd be like, whoa. I mean, this is, this is Peter. Peter has spent three years with Jesus, right? In the physical form, he spent three years with Jesus. And so it would look as if, you know, Peter's faith had failed here. But really, I think at the, at the least, we can say it faltered. He wavered. Because ultimately, and how do we know it was a faith that really faltered and didn't fail? Is because ultimately, it's about how it ends, because in the end, Peter continued to follow Jesus. He returned to him, he repented, and he continued to follow Jesus. It's kind of like the old, old, you know, question of, can you lose your faith? Can you lose your, or not your faith, your salvation? Can you lose your salvation? Right? And then you see someone who, you know, you thought was born again and was walking with the Lord, and then all of a sudden, they're, you know, they're wayward, and they're, they're denouncing Christ, and they're, you know, they're, they're living in the world, and you're like, man, did they lose their salvation? And that, that begs the question, a really huge question, can you lose your salvation? And based on Scripture, I believe you cannot lose your salvation. Well, sin, well then what does, that, what does that say about the person who once looked like they had it and don't? I think really what it speaks of is they never really had it to begin with. Because a true faith cannot fail. Because Jesus is with it. Jesus is attached to it. Jesus is praying for it. And Jesus is never accompanied with failure, right? He, he, he's always faithful. So you want to know if a, a faith is, is true or not? Well, it depends on how it ends. That's the Christian life. It's not so much how you finish but how you, or how you start. It's how you finish, right? If you, if you finish well, it talks about that all throughout the New Testament. Finish well. Run the race with endurance. Run like you want to win. It's about how you finish. So I know his faith was genuine and it faltered because in the end, Peter is restored and he turns back to him and continues to walk with Jesus. So this is an encouragement for us because listen, our, sometimes we doubt, right? And I don't, I don't think in a sense there's nothing wrong with doubting. There's nothing wrong with questioning. But as long as we allow that doubt and those questionings to really build upon that, that foundation of faith, like it draws me closer to him, that I trust him more after those, you know, questions are answered. 
Or maybe they're never answered, but you come to a, a realization that, look, God, I don't fully understand everything, but what I do know and what I do understand is that all throughout Scripture, you're faithful. So I can trust in someone who is faithful, even though I don't have all the answers. So Jesus doesn't pray that Satan doesn't sift Peter. I think that's a point we can get at here, right? That's something we can learn about his prayer for Peter. His prayer is that he's not spared, right? Rather, while he's under the attack of Satan, he prays that his faith would not completely fail. And we know this because Jesus clearly says, I've prayed that your faith may not fail. And if you are saved, if you have put your faith in Jesus, and it's, listen, this is not, I'm not talking about the amount of faith you put in Jesus. Okay, I think sometimes we try to equate, okay, have I put a lot of faith in him? Is it like greater than a mustard seed? No, the, the point is, what, who have you trusted in? I don't know if Jesus really cares about the amount, and I don't even know if we can gauge that, but it's about the object of your faith. You either repent, right? You change your way of mind because we all trust in something. Every single person alive today trusts and believes in something. But repentance means there's a change of mind that once what you trusted in, whether what that was your own self or something else, has now been changed, and I know I no longer trust in myself or whatever it was, but now I trust in Jesus. I trust in him. It's, it's the object of your faith. Who are you trusting in? And if you simply trust in Jesus Christ, there's an encouragement here for us that there's no plan of Satan. There is no trial that could ever come upon you that would cause your faith to fail. Is it, again, is it going to stagger? Are you going to, you know, falter like Peter's going to falter where he's going to deny Jesus three times? Yeah, that may happen. But there's a wonderful word in the Bible and it's called Grace right, that we need to show ourselves grace, that Jesus shows us grace, that we need to show others grace, you know, that when, when they're questioning or they fall, that it doesn't mean that they've completely failed. So again, there's no plan that Satan can have that can ever cause us to truly fail, because true faith will endure, because Jesus desires it to endure. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30 say this, as he speaks of his disciples, he says, my sheep hear my voice, he says, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. As followers of Jesus, we're, we're eternally secure because of that simple trust or simple faith in Jesus. Nothing on the face of earth, nothing in the spiritual realm, nothing on, on Satan's side can ever change our eternal state once we've been saved. We are secure, eternally. I want to share a story with you guys because, you know, obviously we're going to go through things. Satan's going to attack. But when we have Jesus on our side, then nothing, nothing can, can cause us to fail. There's a story of a family. It's the Spafford family. The father, his name was Horatio, he was a prosperous Chicago lawyer, and he was making investments and in properties along Lake Michigan. He and his wife, Anna, they were blessed with four daughters and one son, so they had five kids. They lived comfortably in Lakeview neighborhood on the city's north side. Then all of a sudden, a series of tragedies struck, and first, their four-year-old son, he died of scarlet fever. A short time later, the Chicago fire of 1871 caused extensive damage to the properties that they owned. The economic downturn of 1873 dealt a further blow to his business. In late 1873, needing a break, the family decided to travel to Europe. And needing to stay in Chicago to resolve some fire-related zoning problems, Horatio, the father, the husband, he sent his wife and his four girls ahead. And on November 22nd, the ship was struck by an English vessel in the Atlantic and it sank quickly. Anna, who stayed afloat, the mom, the wife, she stayed afloat by clinging to debris. She was one of only 47 people who survived, and her four daughters drowned. This is a true story. When she reached Wales, Anna sent her husband a telegram, saved alone. The grieving father hastily traveled to meet his grieving wife, and as the ship passed the area where his daughters had died, Horatio, a devout Christian, wrote the hymn, It Is Well. And the first verse says this, 
When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot that was taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You guys know that song. Now it gives you a background of how that song came to be. And so here's this man who's being sifted like wheat. Now this is, this is a, a, a grand extent of it, right? And I pray and I hope that none of us have to go through tragedy like that. But even in the midst of tragedy like that, this man was able to say, it is well with my soul. That I'm sure there were times as he's at night crossing the sea and you know, all that time it took to get to, to his wife, I'm sure there was doubts. I'm sure there was anger. I'm sure there was questioning, like why? But, in the, and, and, but none of that caused his faith to truly fail because ultimately it brought him closer to Jesus and understanding that Jesus is always faithful even when everything around us seems like it's not. And so he's able to say, it is well with my soul. So your faith, it can falter, but it will not fail. Jesus goes on to say in verse 33, or, or Peter does, he says to him, look, you know, you say these things about me like that, that, that Satan's going to come after me. Thanks for praying for me, but look, I don't really need it. <laughs> he says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Do you think he meant it? I really think he meant it. Did he, did he do it? Well, later on in the evening, he doesn't. Remember? Because we're going to see as we get into uh, verse 54 in a couple weeks that he adamantly denies knowing Jesus. So you're like, Peter, what the heck, man? You just said you're going to go to jail with him. You can't, even, you can't even stand up for him. You said you're going to die with him. You can't even just proclaim that you know him. I think he was too boastful and too prideful, spiritually speaking, that he didn't take into account, you know, the verse that we take into account in Corinthians where it talks about, you know, therefore let a man take heed lest he fall. Understand that, that we are not these spiritual giants and that apart from Jesus, my pride can cause me to fail and to fall. And so Peter's going to do that, you know, trusting in him, his own self, his own pride. Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And this is Jesus' response here. He says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. Three times. Three times he will deny him. And Jesus warns him of it. And he knows. He knows Peter's going to fail. But Jesus doesn't give up on him. Right? He knows he's going to falter, but Jesus doesn't give up on him. This isn't the first time that Peter's done something stupid and faltered. Right? Matthew 16, 23, Jesus is rebu- or Peter is rebuking Jesus for talking about being killed. And Jesus says this to him. He says, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> right? He looks right at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me if you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. He's doing the same thing here. He's, he's trusting in himself. He's thinking about the things of men and not the things of God. This isn't the last time that Peter falters as well. Right? He speaks in, uh, there was a few, later, few years later where Peter would, he'd be up north visiting in the Gentile believers at Antioch, and Peter was being gracious for a while, hanging out with the Gentile believers, but when legalistic Jewish teachers showed up, Peter stopped hanging with the Gentiles, and Paul himself had to take action, and he says in Galatians 2.11, he says, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Then we get to the aspect here in verse 54 where he starts to deny Jesus. I mean, Peter, Peter's a great example of our Christian life, a great encouragement that, look, I'm trying with everything that I am to follow Jesus. I love him. I've put my faith in him. But there's going to be times where I'm, I'm, I'm going to stumble. I'm going to mess up. And that's where we as people need to understand and show ourselves grace that, look, if I repent and turn back to him, he's going to pick me up. That if your friend who is, is doing something stupid like Peter's doing, understand that, man, just point them back to Jesus. They haven't lost it, right? They're just in a position now where they've faltered. But Jesus is good. He's faithful. Christian life is it's not easy. You're going to fall sometimes, but with Jesus, you will never, ever fail. And we need to learn compassion on those who fall 
because you and I could be next. Because listen to this, when your faith falters, Jesus doesn't. That's the point of this. He says, I pray for you. I pray for you, Peter. And he says this, after the fall, he says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this time before you deny, deny three times that you know me. But he says this in verse 32, but when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. He knows he's going to fall. Jesus is going to pick him back up. And he says, when I pick you back up, when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Peter, Peter would falter. He would fall. But he would need to turn his life around. Right? The, again, the idea is that when you're going down the wrong road and you realize it, you turn around. Again, it speaks of that repentance. It may take days. It may take minutes. But the point is to turn around. Proverbs 24, 16 says this. For a righteous man may fall, how many times, guys? Seven times. But what does he do? He rises again. But the wicked shall fall by calamity. Jesus knows there's going to be times where you're going to fall. But in that moment, again, we, we turn to him. And he helps us. He saves us. I mean, if, I think of, again, Peter when he's walking on water, right? He start, I mean, he's walking on water. What does he start to do after he walks on water? He starts to sink, right? But what does Jesus do? Jesus is like, dude, really? Well, I'm not helping you out this time. This is the seventh time you've fallen. I'm not picking you back up again. What does Peter say? He says, Lord, save me. So simple. What does Jesus do? He, picks up, he puts his hand in the water and picks him up and pulls him out. When we fall, Lord, save me help me, Jesus picks you back up again because you are considered righteous on his behalf. But the wicked, those who have not put their faith in Jesus, when they fall, they fall by calamity. And so this should not only give a warning to the wicked, but the, the assurance to us as the righteous that we can have a confidence that, that the very thing that Jesus has started in us, that he will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We have this confidence Right, that if we fall down, he picks us up. But for the wicked, there's a warning there that it, when they fall down, they will stay fallen. And Jesus says, when this happens, I want you to, to return and strengthen your brethren. And so we come together as a community, right? We, I've been encouraging you guys with this, that we are not just another get-together. We're not just some after-school program, right? We're not a club. We're not a babysitter service. We are the body of Christ, and so when Jesus picks you back up, he says to strengthen your brothers and your sisters. But that has to happen in the community that we create, right? Not just on Sunday mornings, not just on Wednesday nights, but you guys hanging out outside of service, whether we plan it or not, that you guys know each other, grow together with each other in the Lord, that you go through life together because you need each other. You guys ever seen Lord of the Rings? Yeah? Yeah. Well, if you haven't, go start watching it. Well, ask your parents first. Get their permission. Really, really great movie, movies. In the third movie, at the very end, and I don't want to spoil it. Maybe I shouldn't spoil it. Actually, it doesn't matter. I'm not spoiling anything. There's a part in the end where, where Frodo, obviously, is doing what he's supposed to be doing. But he starts to falter. Right? He starts to falter, but he has his best friend with him. And his best friend gives this amazing speech. It's an awesome scene. It's, it's great. And he starts to pick him up and carry him, right? And I, I, it gives you an idea of here, like, okay, here's, here's this man who, who couldn't take on the burden of his friend, but what he could do is he could strengthen him. He could help him. You know, again, we are not just another get-together. We're here to, to strengthen each other, to encourage each other, to do life together, to build a relationship together. And so in verse 35, we'll get through this quickly. It says, Jesus said to them, when I sent you without money, Without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So if you remember previously in Luke, Jesus sent them out on missions to go cast out demons, to heal the sick, to preach the gospel. And when he sent them, what did he send them with? He says, don't take anything. Right? They would go for days, weeks on end. I don't know. It was for a while. And he sent them with nothing. And they agreed. They said, yeah, you sent us with nothing. Did they lack anything? Did they lack money? Did they lack, you know, shoes and clothing and food and a place to stay? Never, not once. 
God provided, right? God provided, but he says this, times have changed. It's different now. He says, but now, those are the key two words there, but now, he who has a money bag, let him take it. This time, do the opposite. This time, I want you to take it. And let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So Jesus is contrasting the earlier time with with what's coming up ahead. A changing time requires a different response on our part. Change is good. And we need to be open to change. We need to be open to really the leading of the Holy Spirit because there'll be times where the Holy Spirit says, okay, I want you to take absolutely nothing with you on this journey. To then later on, he says, I want you to be completely prepared and take everything that you can with you. And either way, listen, either way, you have to completely rely on Jesus with whatever path you go down. But change is good. Change brings growth. Change brings a, a new place for us to trust Jesus. Right? They had to trust, trust Jesus when he said, don't take anything. And that God would provide somehow. Now they have to trust in Jesus that, okay, I need to work. I need to get, you know, my stuff in order. I need to pack. I need to do all this preparation. I need to trust that he has given me the organizational skills to do this. I need to trust that everything I have is sufficient. I need to trust him. The intent here of Jesus seems to be, I'm, I'm on the point of leaving you, right? He's one day away. He says, when I'm gone, you must use common sense for means, for provision, and for protection. Right? Sometimes we need that. Sometimes we've got to, you know, walk by faith in, in the sense of don't bring anything with you. But sometimes we need to walk by faith by being practical and preparing. You know, you want, you want to go do missions? Part of what you may have to do is get a job and raise your own funds for it. You want to be a missionary overseas? You want to do ministry work over here? You want to do this? You want to do that? You can't always just rely on the Lord to just do some magical miracle. And he can. But sometimes he wants you just to be practical. Like Paul. Paul didn't always rely upon the church for his finances. He didn't always rely on, you know, what's, what's um, GoFundMe right? And sending out letters to his grandparents. Hey, you know, like, I, I need another $5,000 this month. You know, I'm low. What did he do? How did he raise his funds? He worked. You remember what he did? He made tents. He was a tent maker, right? He did all that, and yet he did ministry. So there's a time where you go with nothing, and there's a time where you prepare for everything. But Jesus knows that there's this, there's this new, new time, right? He's leaving them. He's going to send the helper. He wants them to be prepared. He wants them to be prepared, you know, with provision, but also protection. He says this, interestingly, he says, he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Now, we can argue all day, and I don't think we'll get really anywhere, but what does Jesus really mean by this? Is he actually asking them to go purchase a sword, right? To, to really buy a sword like it would be for us you know, purchasing a gun, you know, for, for protection's sake. I want to answer this question, and I want to try to answer this question, but I don't know, I don't know which way it's going to go, okay? So let me say it like this. It wasn't uncommon for travelers to carry a short sword, and I think that's specifically the word here. It's not this mambo sword, you know. It's this short sword to protect themselves against bandits, thieves, those who preyed on them, you know, on, on long stretches of road. You want something to protect yourself, right? So Jesus, I think, is not so much saying, because this is contrary to Jesus, he never wants us to take life. He never calls for violence, right? That, that's contrary to him and his teachings. So I believe if Jesus is going to say, go get a sword, it's not for the fact of, I want you to go out and start slaying people, right? That's not the case. But Jesus, as we're looking at this practically, he wants them to understand to provide for themselves you know, their, their provision, but also for their protection. So you may have something on you, whatever kind of weapon that is, to protect yourself. It's kind of like if you learned, you know, uh, jujitsu. You don't use those skills to attack people, you use it to defend yourself. It's the same sense with a weapon. 
right? You may not learn the skills of jujitsu, but you may learn something simple as a sword or a gun to protect yourself. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and advocate for all these things, okay? I'm just trying to teach it the way that I think Jesus is implying this. So, Jesus, you know, anticipating the times that are ahead for the disciples, knowing that they're going to be journeying, you know, different, lots of different ways. I think to carry a small sword, it doesn't indicate that he wants them to be violent or evil men, but just to be prepared. Just to be prepared. It's no different if you go back to the Lord of the Rings, right? You've got these hobbits. I won't spoil it for you, but you've got these hobbits who have never once gotten a fight in their life. They're gentle. They're small. They're kind of dumb, right? And here they, they go into, they leave the Shire, and they go into the real world. And in the real world, there is some crazy stuff out there. Well, it's not really the real world, but you get what I'm saying, right? And everyone is exponentially bigger, stronger, faster, way more skillful. And you know what they have on them? A sword. Why? Because they need to protect themselves, right? They need to protect themselves. So to carry a sword, again, doesn't indicate violence or that you're evil, but that you're prepared for any contingency. When Peter draws a sword, and we're going to see this, another mistake he makes later on, he's going to draw a sword and he's going to cut off uh, a guy's ear as they come to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus responds and he says this, he says, put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. So Jesus is not advocating to have a sword to go constantly use it to, to, to fight off people and to hurt people. Right? That's not his intent. Right? But it was the fact that, that Peter immediately relied on that. Right? He relied on the way of men than the way of God. That he would rather pull out a sword and cut a guy's ear off than to actually stay up the night before and pray with Jesus. That was the whole point he was getting at. Jesus' whole mission in life is, is to heal and give life, not to bring death. Right? He saves us from death. But if you look at verse 38, it says, They said, Lord, look here. Here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. There's two ways to look at it. There's two ways that commentators look at this. You can look at it as, as practically speaking as we would probably understand it right now as you know, it's enough, it's sufficient, two is good. But well, some commentators take it as Jesus saying, well, that's enough of this conversation, right? I don't know which way to look at it. I think I would lean more towards it's sufficient. Two is good. And so does Jesus encourage his disciples to equip themselves with sword in the coming days in order to carry out their mission in a hostile world? I would say so, right? But again, the main point of, of what he's saying here is that you are to be prepared and to be self-sufficient for whatever comes next. There's change coming. You have to be prepared. And you have to be determined to serve and follow Jesus no matter what. No matter what. And so back in verse 37, which we didn't get to cover, he says, I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me, and he was numbered with the transgress transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. Remember, Jesus constantly talked about this time, this hour that was coming. He's speaking now that it's coming to an end. It's ending. It's near. But he's fulfilling a prophecy here from Isaiah 52 and 53 where it describes the redemptive ministry of the suffering servant where Jesus is going to take upon the sins of the world and Jesus is going to die along the, the other transgressors. And he's going to die along, alongside two guys and what's, what, who are those guys described as? What are they, why are they hanging on the cross? What was their pun? What did they do? They did bad stuff. They were what? They were thieves. Jesus dies alongside two thieves, the transgressors. You and I, we are those transgressors. And so Jesus' death, remember, is to bring life. It's his whole ministry. It's who he is. Jesus is the life giver. He comes to, to, to bring those who were once dead alive again. So again, if we look back at this mentioning of the sword, it's not about Jesus, you know, wanting to take life. It, it's, a, it's a tool, it's an instrument for protection because his whole ministry is about bringing those who were dead back to life. 